Good evening, everybody. This is Pastor Tim Mason, Associate Pastor at Incarnation Lutheran Church on this Wednesday night in Lent. And uh, normally we would all be meeting in the sanctuary and uh, have a full service. Um, and that means tonight's devotional will be a little bit more involved. I think it's going to be a little bit more, um, more like a sermon. But Let's, and let's, let's start out. Let's start out in prayer. Let's pray together and let's unite our hearts even though we're in different places. Gracious Lord God, I thank you for today. You gave us this day to live and to rejoice, to serve, and to see the beauty that is around us. You also gave us this day to contemplate what's going on in this world. And you also speak to our hearts. Lord, I ask at this time that you forgive us for all the things that block our ears and our heart from hearing you calling us, talking to us, giving us your peace. Forgive us and help us to loosen all the things that distract us away from your goodness, your love, your mercy, your justice. And through our Lenten, Lenten journey, Lord, Help us to understand that we belong to you. We need you. You are the center of everything. In your precious name I pray. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to talk about Nicodemus. Um, Nicodemus is kind of one of my heroes because Nicodemus is, is the story of Nicodemus is, is a story about a man who, um, through meeting Jesus, really, his life was totally changed. And it wasn't safe. It wasn't safe at all. See, Nicodemus, he was a Pharisee. And he was well-trained. He knew scripture. Um, and he had head knowledge. Head, head knowledge. There's six, 613, 613 um, laws that he understood, had it memorized, lived by, very regimented, and things like that. And these 613 laws had to be obeyed. But he also, I mean, he understood lots of things about the scripture and lots of the stories. And, and there's lots of stories about God's faithfulness. All the stories about um, the, the, the big stories of the Old Testament, really what it's talking about, especially if Israel or somebody is, is, is vanquished or whatever, God picks them up. And it's a story about God continuing always to pick up Israel if they've fallen down or gotten lost and things like that. So... Um, God's faithfulness to God's people is really kind of the core message to to a lot of the things that uh, he's learned and memorized. Okay, so he's got the head knowledge on it. But then there's these other verses, and I, I saw this a lot when I was in Israel. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. All right. There's not any thou shalt nots and all that kind of stuff. It's all about doing. For us to be the people of God, it's not those 613 laws. But hear this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you shall love the Lord. Now this concept of love comes involved. As, as we learn to, to, to love the one who loves us, that changes the way we see things. Because if we know God loves us, there's no difference between the person that is next to us. God loves that person too. The issue is for me to understand that truth. And that helps us to understand the, the, the greatest commandments. First, you love God that helps us to love neighbor. And then there's this other verse that really kind of, um, in my discussions um, with some of the rabbis that I've known, um, Deuteronomy 10, 18, um, God who, execute, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow and who loves the strangers, providing them food and clothing. Oh my goodness. That message changes things a little bit, or actually focuses things. This love thing, love for who? Well, love here's for the outsiders, the powerless, those sometimes the ones that, that feel like the most hopeless. Kind of reminds me of how I've been feeling, and this is only second day of this 
quarantining. So Nicodemus had plenty of head knowledge until, until this teacher from Nazareth, from the north, starts coming down. And he starts hearing stories. Now, the, the Pharisees sent um, people up to go and see what certain teachers or preachers were doing. And they would come back and tell the stories. So we had Nicodemus and the other Pharisees that were working in the temple doing their thing. But they, their servants or their whoever, the, the, the people, the messengers would come back and they'd hear about Jesus teaching and this teaching has great authority and his healing. Um, the blind can see. Uh, people who everybody thought was dead is, is alive again. Um, all these things that Nicodemus starts hearing and now he is very attracted to when Jesus comes into town. Um, and we see that in scripture a lot. Jesus comes into Jerusalem and um, goes off to other places. But then one of the, in the, the texts we've been looking at late, lately, Jesus comes into the temple and he does something that we wouldn't see in a nice little um, greeting card or whatever. He made a whip. He made a whip and he upset all the systems they had for, that allowed people to give their offerings. They had to exchange their money into temple money. They, they had to have a gift. And so you had people selling gifts. No, no, the, the temple is not about selling and, and, and making an offering this way. The place that the temple is a place to learn about God and God's love. And that's the whole thing. That's everything what Jesus is about. And so what he saw there was an abomination. And then when the people asked him, what authority do you have to do this? He says, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. And I think for Nicodemus, this was a crucial point. Because he saw now face to face what Jesus was doing through his actions and his words. And suddenly... All that scripture that he had up here became alive. In Jesus' teaching, his actions, and what he was doing, suddenly all the scriptures that he knew became alive. And maybe the spirit went into his heart a little bit, and the waters of his heart were stirred. And suddenly he began to understand about that caring for the orphan, the stranger, and the widow. And suddenly, I think his... His head knowledge began to turn into heart knowledge. So Nicodemus, in the dark of night, he follows his heart. And he does what he has to do. He does what his heart is demanding of him to do. And he goes to speak to Jesus face to face, um, knowing full well that this is very dangerous. So Nicodemus visits Jesus. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, which is quite an honor, for Nicodemus to call Jesus. We know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born, be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born well there's some grammar to that jesus answered very truly i tell you no one can enter the kingdom of god without being born of water and spirit now this complicated things for nicodemus what is born of the flesh is flesh and what is born of the spirit is spirit do not be astonished that i said to you you must be born from above the wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who was born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we've seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. 
And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, and remember that was done for healing, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. And what we really need to remember is verse 17. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That word, that the world might be saved through him. I wonder what was going on through Nicodemus' mind, because he knew about the, the prophecies of the Messiah. Messiah talks about, that's all about one who comes to save. And he's watching Jesus doing these things. And I think he started to put two and two together. And the Spirit of God started to, to work inside him. And he began to understand that all the stuff that he learned was pointing to Jesus. And I think this Pharisee, Nicodemus, began to change. Except his colleagues, no. They were afraid. And as we're learning lately, fear is not useful for anything. They were afraid of losing their positions, their power, their status, all these kind of things. And they were hell-bent on making sure that Jesus would die. But Nicodemus showed his colors in chapter 7. He came to the aid of Jesus. Chapter 7, verse 50. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus before and who was one of them, asked, Our law does not judge people without first giving them a hearing to find out what they are doing, does it? They replied, Surely you're not also from Galilee, are you? Search and you will see that no prophet is to arise from Galilee. Well, they made it clear that if you cross the line, Nicodemus, you are in danger of possibly the same outcome that they're searching. But Nicodemus showed his colors. He had become a believer. And he began to stand by the justice that the law had um, for the people. But his colleagues, they were so afraid again. And they were determined to make sure that Jesus, who they called a troublemaker, would die. And from verse 38, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus already, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed the body. Nicodemus, who had, for, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Can you imagine what it was like for these two men who had come to faith by listening to Jesus, by seeing Jesus and allowing the Spirit to enter their heart and allowing it to change them? Both of them were very wealthy men, we understand that. And follow, But following Jesus would cost them everything. After the resurrection, tradition tells us that Nicodemus was kicked out of the Pharisee, the Pharisaic club, as I'd kind of like to call it, which means he lost everything. He lost his income, probably lost his home, he certainly lost his status in, in Jerusalem. Um, but he also gained freedom. He had come to faith and he was transformed. And it didn't matter if he memorized all this stuff. His heart was transformed through the service and the love of Jesus. His head knowledge, which was no use of really to anybody, became heart knowledge. And he became free. Now, coming to faith actually means that all the stuff of the law kind of is comes together, is pulled together. Because the law, again, the center of the law is talking about love, loving God, and then loving neighbor. 
And when we do that, community is formed, community is strengthened, community is also, and this is important for a church, is identified. Especially when in this world right now going on, everybody's separated, but here we are as a church, we're doing the very best we can. Very best we can as being who we are, the people of God. One of the things that I'm doing during this time is I'm calling a lot of our members, and hopefully I'll get a hold of you too, um, but I've had some of our members tell me, they say, be sure to tell me who, who needs help, who needs help in getting groceries or anything like that. And when I hear that, I am just inspired because it's, it may be even a little dangerous to go out, I don't know, but the thing is, is that so many of our members, um, when they hear that there's need, what comes up is the here am I, send me, let me be the one that, that take somebody to the hospital if they need that, or pick up medicine, or do something. And just that whole idea of somebody telling me, saying, thank you, Pastor, for calling me. Now, if you hear of anybody in need, be sure to let me know so I can help out. Now, that gives me hope. And remember, as people of faith, there is always hope. Um, and you know, I think personally in the last couple of days when well, gosh we're only really only a couple of days into this and really this is a time I don't know about the future I don't know what's going to happen and suddenly my faith or my understanding of faith has grown much deeper faith used to be like well I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow but really we kind of did right now we don't and so suddenly, this faith that we've been given isn't something that's trivial, isn't something that's done out of rote action like memorizing 613 laws. This faith becomes real when we believe, when we serve, when we're courageous in serving, courageous in saying, yes, God, I believe you, I follow you, and I know that you have my heart in your hands. Now, there's a lot of people we're all concerned about. But I want to make sure that we pray for the world, our healthcare workers, and all the people living in real fear of losing their homes or apartments because they are losing jobs right now as we speak. I really don't know how things are going to change. I want to ask you to make sure you begin your day with a good devotion. Find a good devotional. I use Sarah Young's call, um, Jesus Calling. I've been using the same one for years. But there's so many good ones. Go on elca.org and I'm sure you can find um, devotions. And start your day with a devotion. So you start focused on God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness. We stumble, we fall down, we're, we're the ones filled with doubt. But God is faithful. We have a living God. And in Jesus' words and actions, the scripture comes alive. And the same thing happens with you. When you say, here am I, send me, you make those scriptures come alive. Let us pray. Gracious God, I thank you for being with us on this very peculiar Lenten journey. We have a lot of ideas for what we might need to do in the near future, but everything is in the air. We truly are living hour by hour, minute by minute. I ask, Lord, that you send your spirit to calm our hearts. Some of us like to be in control, to know what's going on, but frankly, Nobody is in real control. The only control we have is to know our identity. And that is that you call us your children. Help us to remember that every single day. To keep us centered. To keep us at peace. To know what we are here to do. To love one another. To serve one another. And even in the midst of this craziness, to live in hope and maybe even a little bit of joy. 
May God bless you all. Um, I can't wait for us that we can all be together, worship together, and I can hear our choir and sing together and pray together. And the day will come. It will come. And so I ask, may, may God bless you all, give you peace, help you to rest, and uh, be creative. Be creative in these times and uh, know that we are church. Good night.